Chapter 2 When I woke up in the emergency room, the doctor, a heavy-set man with more hair growing out of his ears than on his head, was giving Dad a routine list of things for me to avoid. Dad kept reminding him we'd been through this before, but the doctor was determined to finish reading the checklist. And last but not least, strobe lights are a big no-no. Great, there go the disco lessons. I don't need another list of special foods to avoid, or another series of MRIs, or an adjusted dosage to my medication. What I really needed was to avoid losing control of my bowels in front of my classmates. Oh, and I almost forgot, said the doctor. I'll need your son's driver's license. There are two things I really hate in this world. One is when adults refer to me in the third person while I'm in the room. Second is having my license taken away for six months according to the state law regarding seizures. Rarely do I get both of them at the same time. Dad knew this was a severe blow to my independence, but I think he was secretly relieved too. Playing dutiful parent overshadowed what that bratty little shit had said about me after the game. Dad put some compassion into the performance as he reached out his hand sympathetically for me to fork over my license. Any vestige of what had been said after the game was now buried in that special treasure chest where he locked away all his secret shames, his career, his hand, mom, and now me. I remember when I was a little boy, Martina Navratilova moved into our town for a brief time in an expensive compound by the bay where she could quietly train for the U.S. Open. The local paper did a cover story on her in the feature section. With her racket slung over her shoulder, she posed by a crepe myrtle bush and gazed wistfully into the sky. My father sat at the kitchen table with the paper that morning with extra care. His bad back had kept him up every night that week, and I knew to tread carefully when his back pain was flaring up. The only thing that pissed him off more than the pain itself was the way the government refused to pay for the medical bills. With his prior dangerous career, they explained, it would be very difficult for him to prove that the damage to his spine was a direct result of combat during his military service. Mom gave Dad his egg sunny side up, with a tiny purple pill on the side of the plate. It took him a few minutes to position the fork carefully between the mangled numbs that remained on his bad hand. He was going through one of those phases where he'd convinced himself that with enough training, he could learn to use that hand. He carefully speared bites of egg and slowly propelled them to his mouth. He dropped the fork onto the plate a couple of times before he finally switched to his good hand. He read the paper and chewed for a while and pretended like nothing was wrong. Then he looked up from his eggs and held the newspaper article out over my crunch berries. This is one of the world's biggest problems, son, he shook his head. Hal, leave it alone, Mom said from the kitchen and stifled a yawn. He looked over at her for an instant. I thought he was annoyed at the yawn, a crime against his scintillating conversational skills. I had no idea at the time why he was really mad at her, what that yawn really meant. That would all come out later. Mom served Dad more eggs and set a glass of orange juice in front of me. When I reached for the glass, she locked her pinky finger with mine just for a moment, not long enough for my father to see, but long enough for me to know she was there for me. She's what you call gay, Dad continued, despite my mother's wishes. That means instead of liking men, she likes to be with girls. I like girls, I said. It was true. Breda Zimmer was my best friend in school that year. Damn straight, he said. Mom disappeared down the hall to the laundry room. Do you know what they call a man who likes to be with another man? Dad asked. I peered down into my bowl. My crunch berries were getting mushy in the milk. I hated mushy crunch berries. How? My mother stopped for a moment. Hard to pinpoint a corner of the house. You call them queer, he cringed. These people will never have a normal life. They are the ultimate downfall of our society, too, because if it were up to them to proliferate, there wouldn't be any reproduction, and we would fail to continue as a species. Dad speared another chunk of eggs with his fork. It's Darwinian. I watched a crunchberry sink to the bottom of the bowl. What's Darwinian? I asked. I tried to keep my eyes on my bowl. I didn't want to make eye contact with Dad. When I did look up briefly, glare from the morning sun caught my eye, and I thought I saw a dirty mop bucket floating down the hallway toward us, but I couldn't see Mom behind it. My eyes must have been playing tricks on me. I quickly looked back down to my cereal. Never mind, he said. All you need to know is that it's wrong. In fact, the only thing you that could be you could be that's worse in one of these so-called 
professional heroes with superpowers. Sons of bitches wouldn't know their asses from a sploosh. The mop bucket floated down over my father's head, turned upside down, and showered my father with a filthy, scummy lather. Through the glare of the sunlight, I still couldn't see my mother. They're ready for you at checkout, a perky young nurse whose polished name tag said Randy with an exclamation point announced to us. Her ponytail, situated too far on top of her head, sprung out in all directions like a poorly bleached tropical fern. I wondered what she was thinking when they asked her to spell her name on for her name tag, and she added the exclamation point. Careful you don't hit on too many of the nurses, Dad said as he wheeled me past checkout. I don't want to come home from work one night and find the house full of candy stripers. I mustered a weak smile. Now he was overcompensating. Maybe Dad hadn't buried that post-game comment after all. Since the doctors took away my license, I had to beg for uh, rides wherever I wanted to go. School would break for summer soon, and that meant I had my jobs to get to. If I didn't make the van on time, I'd miss the morning shift on the highway custodial crew. The late guys always got stuck with mowing the median, a much harder chore than picking up trash on the side of the road. My shift would end just in time for me to catch a local commuter train to the Crosstown bus, which left me barely enough time to make it to the mall for the lunch and dinner shift at Schmalsey's Cafeteria. I could always tell exactly how late I was by the size of the stack of dishes in the sink beside the Hobart. Good thing I was a fast washer. The late guy inherited the macaroni and cheese pan. All the scouring in the world couldn't scrape the crust off those things. But I did my best. I picked tiny bits of steel wool out of my hands every night before I crashed. In a few minutes, I'd have to, in a few weeks, I'd have to add the summer basketball league to this crazy schedule. I smelled like grease and detergent, but if I hustled, I could make it on time. Throw in my night's tutoring at the Student Life Center, and it made for one exhausted me. The mad scramble for transportation got really old really fast. I was constantly late for everything. I felt bad when I stood up my students one night because the Crosstown bus broke down. And Coach suddenly stopped speaking to me, which had never happened before. I hope it didn't have anything to do with that comment that Gary Coleman twerp made. No, it was probably just because I was always late. He hated tardiness. His usual punishment included an agonizing series of wind sprints at the end of practice. But instead, Coach did nothing. He gave me the total silent treatment, which was actually worse. One night after practice, I'd stopped. I just started doing the wind sprints myself, hoping to get back into his good graces. Dad couldn't help me either, not because he didn't want to drive me, but because all my running around usually occurred during the long hours of his never-ending workday, and we depended on his overtime to pay for the third mortgage he'd taken out on the house by then. Eventually, I just threw in the towel, went to the garage, and pumped air into the tires of my old uh, dirt bike. Hell, it beat walking, except for when it rained or when you weren't in the mood for public humiliation. One day, I was riding my bike to practice after work because Coach had asked to see me early. I was running late, so I pedaled as fast as I could. I was more than a little annoyed when I stopped for a red light at a crowded intersection and found myself surrounded by a gang of kids on uh, skateboards. The oldest one must have been at least a couple of years older than me. Younger than me. He was getting the first whisper of a mustache on his lips. You kidding me? He spoke through a menthol cigarette that dangled from his lips. That bike's like 20 years old. Mag wheels? I rolled my eyes and waited for the light to change. When it changed to green, I stood up on the bike to press down on the pedal as hard as I could to distance myself from this bad after-school special. But the bike didn't lurch forward like it should have. Something was dragging behind it, holding it back. I turned around and saw the kid with a quasi-mustache, his hands gripping the back of the bike for a free ride on a skateboard. I thought about clocking him, but the only thing more humiliating than riding your dirt bike to school is getting in a fight with a bunch of kids. What are you doing, dumbass? Busy intersection, lots of cars. The kid looked back at his friends and grinned. He was in full showmanship mode now, and it was only getting going to get worse. It's called skitching, asshole, he said to me. It means I get a free ride. Whoomp! The blur of a car whizzed by and knocked him off the back of my bike. He bounced off the car's windshield and flew high into the air. I didn't see him land because it was clear on the other side of the street from across the traffic. His skateboard veered across the intersection, somehow missed every car, and disappeared into a sewer. The car screeched to a halt. The kid's friends raced over to his side. One of them had the good sense to use his cell phone to take a picture. 
The driver of the car called an ambulance, and by the time I got there, the injured kid, drained of all color, was coughing up blood. I moved quickly before any of the stunned bystanders could protest, and I grabbed his hand between my two his head between my two hands. Hey, kid! I tried to get his attention. His eyes were glossy, rolling back in his head like a porcelain doll's. Hey, dumbass! I'm talking to you. I yelled at him to keep him conscious, to keep his attention on my voice while my hands did their work. My hands burned as I yelled, "Don't ever do that again! You hear me?" I shook him by the shoulders, and I felt my hands were felt like my hands were going to melt. You hear me? Traffic had stopped by now, and people were gathered around me. A gruff man with a tire iron had organized a group of adults to move me away from the injured kid. They began to approach. Finally, the boy's limp eyeballs popped to life, and he looked at panic around him. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. He wiped the blood away from his mouth. The coughing had stopped, and there really was no more blood trickling out. He even stood up. Really? I'm sorry. Is everyone okay? The ambulance arrived moments later, but I was long gone by then. I heard the paramedics had to treat the driver of the car that hit the kid more than they had to do anything for the kid himself. The driver was apparently in shock, hyperventilating from the whole ordeal, and the kid with a quasi-mustache had given her the paper bag that he carried his cigarettes in so she'd have something to breathe into. The driver accidentally inhaled the receipt, and the paramedics had to fish it out of her windpipe. I stopped in the parking lot in front of the gymnasium and puked into the bushes. I wiped my mouth. I don't like throwing up, but I was getting better at this. My fingers didn't even twitch this time. You're late, coach said when I finally arrived, disheveled and worn out. He clutched a potato, uh, excuse me, he clutched a tub of potato chips and offered me one. Um, No thanks, I said. Listen, Tom, I'm going to have to cut to the chase here. He shuffled a few papers on his desk. They were yellow with age. How long have you played center for me? Five years. Really? Is that all? His eyes rolled up as he tried to remember, like he was trying to look into the back of his brain. I thought it was more than that. I stared at a coffee mug on his desk. It said number one dad in big bright letters, and it was half full with coffee from the morning. The creamer had congealed into a thick film on the surface. He chomped down on the potato chip, shook his head, and shrugged. Well, the point is, I've been looking after you for a long time now, and I only have your best interest at heart. Uh Uh-oh, here it comes. This little medical problem of yours, it's got us worried. See, we have extremely high insurance premiums to pay here at the school. It's getting to the point where I don't know how any athletic athletic program can survive. Do you understand what I'm saying? He fiddled with a burned chip in his puffy fingertips. He focused on the chip so they didn't have to look me in the eye. Finally, he popped it in his mouth. Why wouldn't he look at me? It couldn't be the seizures. People haven't thought you could catch those since the Dark Ages. Since they all thought all you needed to feel better was a good leeching. Plus, the coach had a daughter with cerebral palsy. My mind drifted, and I looked at the potted plant on his desk. It was made of three branches. The first branch was dark green and normal. The second was pretty normal except for the cobwebs on it, and the third was desiccated and dying. Coach spotted me staring at the dying branch, then watered the plant with the dregs of his uh, coffee mug. Tom, I don't think you can be on our team anymore. What the hell was he talking about? He didn't think I could be on the team anymore. Did I just have my hands amputated and nobody told me? Of course I could still play on the team. Maybe you'd be more comfortable on the junior squad. I tried to get this straight in my head. He wanted me to go play with a bunch of kids in junior high because I had a seizure disorder? It's really a matter of priorities. The safety of the school. Your health, he rattled on. Insurance insurance premiums. Liability issues. And suddenly it all made sense. Why he'd been giving me the silent treatment at practice why he wouldn't look at me anymore. I'd known all along. I just didn't want to admit it. He'd heard what that little Gary Coleman twerp had said about me outside the gym after the game, and now he didn't want me around. I made him uncomfortable. Because I'm different? I wanted to hear him say it. He finally looked at me, and I could see something right behind his eyes. It wasn't a look of disappointment. It was a look of disgust. Because you're different. He bit down on a potato chip. I touched the dead branch of the potted plant on his desk. I fiddled with its brown leaves while I thought about what I should say. I was fuming, burning inside out with anger. I wanted to tell him that I didn't deserve this. I considered begging him to let me stay on the team so I could still play. Then I considered telling him he could take his JV squad and shove it up his... But then I saw something that told me exactly what I was going to say. As Coach reached for another chip, I noticed that from the depths of his chest, a dark black glow emanated, a murky wave. I can't explain how I knew what it meant, but it was as natural 
and understanding as you have when you pull your hand away from scalding hot water. A strange thought occurred to me. A voice in my head said I could reach out and touch the thick, murky darkness and shape it in my hands and roll it like a lump of Play-Doh until it dissolved into my palms. My hands felt hot, seething, but I didn't reach out and touch the darkness. That same voice in my head told me it was too much for me to handle. That would hurt me, so I didn't go near him. Instead, I put my hands in my pockets and stood up. If you don't get an electrocardiogram soon, I said, you're going to die. I stopped at the door on my way out and added, you probably won't even make it to next season. I glanced at the potted plant, now with three healthy branches, and I slammed the door behind me as I left. I came home early and stood in the hallway and watched the sun go down outside. Walking upstairs, taking off my jacket, or grabbing a snack required too much effort. I didn't want, I didn't have to work, and I wasn't supposed to be at the learning center, so there was nothing to unglue my feet from the floor. My head throbbed, and I wanted to sleep for a million years until there was nothing left to worry about. Finally, I went to Dad's desk bureau, crowded with bills and insurance paperwork, and unplugged the, lap- unplugged the laptop. I took his real estate homework off the top of the computer and brought it up to my room to check my email. Maybe I'd get a head start on that history paper, too. Instead, I went straight for the porn. I had strict rules about looking at porn. First off, I wasn't allowed to think about suicide after I looked at it. Years ago, when I'd first figured out I was a sucker for a nice hairy chest, I thought for sure I'd have to kill myself before I was 18. The closer I got to 18, the more I had to rethink that solution. Second, there couldn't be anyone in the house when I did it. The last thing I needed was to get caught messing off to an oiled muscle stud. A few years ago, when our class took a field trip to Washington, Ridge Robertson was caught beating off to a men's exercise magazine. He had some lame excuse about how the magazine was left under the bed, and he was just doubled over with stomach cramps or something. But then he came to school after a week-long absence with bruises all over his face, his arm in a cast, and an awkward limp. He told everyone he had been in a car accident, but people had spotted his family's cars, and there was no signs of any damage. A few weeks later, his family sent him away to a boarding school and moved out of town. Third rule, it had to be clean. No horses, no pets, no scat, and absolutely no kids. I never understood the fascination with young hairless boys anyways. I wanted someone big and broad and hairy, a real man like you used to see in magazines and on TV from the late 70s. Mechanics, plumbers, lifeguards, and cowboys with dirty hands. And lastly, the site had to be worthwhile. Otherwise, my imagination was always better. One of the sites I most frequented visited most frequently visited was the Hero Fantasy Worship website. I don't know anyone who turns my crank more than Uberman, but it's not just the body. Honest, the guy is the paragon of everything a man should aspire to be. The perfect hero. Super strength, the power of flight, invincibility, all the A-level superpowers. But his strength of character was just so damn perfect, too. Always saying the right thing on the news after a big fight. Never too busy to thank his fans. Hell, the man even found time after saving the world to help small pets in various forms of distress. Perfect skin, a great smile with impossibly bright, but not horsey, teeth, and strong chiseled features. Okay, so his body was also amazing, but I'd noticed the detail others might have overlooked. For instance, his legs were as big as his upper body, in perfect proportion. I always laugh when I see some muscle guy at the gym who bench presses some ungodly sum of weight, and then when he hops up from the bench, you see he's teetering on top of skinny legs, like a Smithfield ham walking on toothpicks. I'd never seen him up close, only briefly, flying through the sky with the rest of the league. From, from what I'd seen on TV, his muscular proportions were the same as the, as the drawn, impossibly buff version of him in his comic book. Once I'd even bought a poster of Uberman to put on my wall. It was a rebellious phase during my first year of high school. I was at the comic book convention at the Radisson and saw this poster of Uberman, shirtless but still wearing his cape. He had impressive nipples spread across his perfectly built, massive chest. I deliberately left my bag of, of comic books by a magazine stand so that once all my friends had left to wait at the bus stop, I could run back inside and buy the poster without anyone seeing me. I don't know what the hell I was thinking, like I could come home and nail Uberman on my ceiling above my head. The poster wasn't tabooed just because of the sexual implications either. Anything that people, anything about people with superpowers was forbidden in my house. We couldn't even talk about them. There was this one time when I was a kid and I'd first joined the basketball team and Clayton Camp came over to play. We'd shot baskets in the driveway with the hoop my dad had just hung above the garage. When we got bored, Clayton ran inside and pulled out some action figures from his overnight bag, all superheroes, all superpowered. 
I'll be Uberman. You can be right wing. He handled me my action figures. Superheroed, superpowered heroes were bad enough, but right wing was outright treason. I don't know if that's a good idea, I replied. I glanced over at my father hosing down lime in the yard. He stopped by the bushes to drop a garter to chop a garter snake in half with a shovel. He disappeared into the backyard to dispose of the remains. Come on, it'll be fun. We can blow up some people or something. I've got firecrackers. He pulled some low-grade fireworks out of his bag. We played at the foot of the driveway near the gutter and behind the bushes so no one could see us. We used the figurines to simulate our own, simulate our own battle sequence, and with Clayton at the helm, there was a lot of death and destruction. He went for a cra- firecracker to blow up some of his old sister's Barbies. Why don't you just use the flare instead? I cut my eyes toward the yard. I couldn't see my dad. Something not so loud. Good idea, he said. We'll torture hair. Somehow, Uberman and Rightwing, despite their combined super speed, let Barbie's head melt to an expressionless clump of hair and plastic under the heat of the flare. Clayton reached for the pack of firecrackers and then lit a match. Look out, it's Frankie Flamethrower. He's going to finish her off, Clayton shouted. Clayton, don't light the... I reached for the firecrackers, but he'd already lit a fuse before I could get the words out. He held the firecrackers high in the air, away from me, and pushed me to the ground. The wicket almost burned down to the cracker, and I could see in a split second it would explode the entire pack in Clayton's hand. A flicker of panic sparked in his eyes. Then he looked to his hand and saw how quickly the wicks were burning down. Throw it, I yelled. Throw it! But he was too scared to do anything, like the firecrackers were stuck to his hand with glue. He was frozen. But he was scared, too scared to do anything, like the firecrackers were stuck to... Oh, I already read that. And a forceful stream of water blasted the fireworks out of his hand and almost knocked him off his feet. I looked up and saw Dad standing across the yard with the garden hose gun. He marched over toward a spring water nonstop from the hose. He never left the stream off the fireworks until he was certain that there wasn't a spark left. Then he turned the water on the action figures and blasted them into the gutter. My heroes! Clayton watched the force of the water wash them down the gutter. Clayton slipped in the mud as he struggled to get up. He was crying, still scared and humiliated. My dad reached out his hand to help him up. Clayton pushed my father away and ran inside crying. I stared at the muddy handprint on my father's work shirt. Then I picked up some soggy firecrackers to throw in the garbage. That was the last time Clayton ever came over. So it didn't seem like such a good idea to put up a poster of a superhero, shirtless or not. I ended up throwing the poster away in a dumpster behind the food lion. But that didn't mean I couldn't go online every now and uh, every now and again to sneak a look. The website promised a lot of treats for subscribers, but I wasn't stupid enough to give them a credit card number. My dad had been through enough scandals to last a lifetime, and he didn't need to add gay internet porn to the list next time he went in to get his hard drive replaced. Which is why I was super careful to wipe the history of all the sites prior before I gave the computer back. I cruised around the free tour section, which I'd only been through about 100 times. The last page had the shot of Uberman totally naked except for the join now strategically placed over his manhood. Most people would feel shortchanged, which I'm sure was the intended effect, and sign up immediately to see what he had underneath that icon. Still, I knew better than to pay for it. Plus, the picture would be totally bogus. It would be Uberman's head superimposed on some other guy's body anyway. I could tell because the nipples were nowhere near as big as they had been on the poster. Like I said, my imagination was always better, and that picture, with all it suggested, was more than enough for me. To help fall asleep at night, I used to make up scenarios about Uberman. This was a favorite. He'd pick me up from a game after school and drive me home, and we'd be totally in love, and I'd lay my head in his lap as he drove. I'd look up at him, and he'd look back down at me with a smile, the corners of his full lips turning up ever so slightly, until he couldn't help but pull over the side of the road and kiss me. Another favorite, Uberman rescues me from some terrifying situation where I'd valiantly defended a group of innocent bystanders, kindergartners, physically challenged kindergartners, Gardeners, against one of his arch nemesis hell bent on the destruction of innocence. Uberman would swoop in right as I dove in front of the death beam to save the children, and in an instant he'd block the beam and kick the supervillain's ass, and I'd knock out the henchman who had miraculously crawled over to the death ray and was about to push the self destruct button. Such an act of valor would elicit a personal invitation back to Uberman's pad, where we'd exchange coy pleasantries about our favorite music. Uh, bond over our favorite music, and then he'd whisper words meant only for me right before he'd take me to his perfectly, take me in his perfectly tanned hands and, Tom, where's my computer? Dad had called out. His voice was close. He couldn't be far down the hall. God, he was stealthy when he wanted to be. I hadn't even heard him come home. 
I fumbled to uh, pull my pants up. Tom, I have my real estate class tonight. I need the computer. I struggled to pull up my pant leg and tried to smack the power button at the same time. The result wasn't pretty. I tripped over the DSL line and tumbled over onto my face. I heard a nauseating crunch when the laptop bounced off the bed and landed on a hardwood floor a few inches away from the soft cushioned throw rug. Dad knocked and opened the door in a quick, in one quick gesture. Geez, Tom, what are you doing in here? The good news was that I'd fallen on my front, so you couldn't tell my pants were undone. But the bad news was I saw Dad looking over at the open laptop. That was it. My life was over. I looked over my shoulder and saw a blank screen. Tom, I've told you a million times not to use the computer on the floor. Someone might step on it. Sorry. He paused and looked at the room suspiciously. You okay? I thought about that kid who'd been hit by the car earlier, how his ribs had made the same crunching noise as the computer. I'm fine, really. I'll put that lasagna in the oven for you. I know it's leftovers, but it's always better a few days later anyways. He fiddled with some pocket, uh, change in his pocket. I should be back from class before you go to bed. Okay, I said. You can go now. He stood for a minute and looked around the room. I knew he was apologizing for a shitty dinner. I knew he just wanted, he just wished he could afford a steak night Still, wished he could afford a steak dinner for us every night. I knew he was ashamed. His only hope to get out of the shittery factory was the real estate class at the learning annex every third Tuesday of the month. I wanted to tell him I didn't care about that any of that. It didn't matter to me what the hell he did for a living, but I wasn't even that hungry anyways. I wanted to tell him that I, what I was going through, all these changes, and some of them scared me, and I just really needed to hear him tell me that everything was going to be okay. But I didn't say a word because more than anything, I wanted him to leave so I could zip up my pants and fix the computer. Dad picked at the grime underneath his fingertails, fingernails for a second and then headed down the hallway to his room. As soon as he left, I rushed over to the laptop and tried to turn it back on. Nothing. This was bad, really bad. That picture would still be on it if the repairman turned it back on and my life would be over. I picked up the laptop and shook it to see if I could hear anything. I heard some loose plastic bits rattling around inside the hard drive like I was shaking a near-empty bottle of aspirin. I sat on the bed and tried to remain calm. Maybe I could fix this. I took a deep breath and rubbed my hands over the smooth surface of the laptop and waited. My hands didn't get hot, and I smacked them together a few times to see if I could ignite a twitch in one of my fingers. Maybe my powers extended to inanimate objects. I looked over at the electrical socket in the wall and thought about sticking my finger in it. I tried whispering a prayer while I rubbed my hands over the screen. I booked us a court tomorrow if you want to play. Dad poked his head back in the room. What are you doing? Um, I took my hands off the computer and rubbed them together. Just praying my English paper gets an A. Dad looked at me curiously, like he wanted to smile with me, but something didn't add up. He walked over to my bed, reached down and grabbed the computer. Wait! Dad was surprised by the outburst. He folded the laptop shut and tucked it under his arm. He rubbed his eyes together and thought about the right thing to say. Look, I know most of your friends have their own computer, and as soon as I get my realtor's license, I'll be making enough to get you one. He took his thumb and pulled down the skin beneath my lower eyelid, a not-so-subtle gesture to see if I was on something. Then he mussed my hair and said, For now, we have to share. I listened to his footsteps, growing softer and softer as he walked down the hallway, down the stairs, out the screen door, slammed shut behind him. I heard him rev up his old Camaro and pull out of the driveway, careful to avoid the cracked pavement at the foot of the driveway. He'd open the computer and see that picture, the gay superhero porn site, and understand everything in all in one nauseating moment of clarity. I stared out of the window at the full moon and watched it cast shadows that danced over the mulch in our backyard like skeletons on the freshly dug grave. I knew I had to leave. <laughs>